It's my pleasure to welcome our next keynote speaker, Marika Holland. Marika is a senior scientist and the section head for the Paleo and Polar Climate Research Section of Climate and Global Dynamics Lab at NCAR. Thanks again, Marika, for accepting our invite and look forward to your talk. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak here. So I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully you can yeah, see it's my full talk. screen. Yeah. All right. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So um so I'm gonna talk with you today about sea ice predictability. So I'm a sea ice geophysicist and a climate scientist. And so I normally often think about things on very long time scales, kind of century time scales. But more and more with the changes happening in the Arctic, I think a lot of people in my field have started thinking about sea ice predictability predictions on shorter timescales. So I will be talking about initial value predictability. It's sort of seasonal and maybe a little bit longer um, timescale. So it's really not sub-seasonal, at least I won't touch on that too much. But I'm also gonna bring in a climate angle to this and talk a little bit about how we expect these initial value predictability characteristics of sea ice to potentially change in the warming climate. And I'm sorry, hopefully that someone just started mowing the lawn next door. Hopefully that noise isn't filtering through too much, but what can you do? Okay, so um, that's kind of the context for my talk. And I think um, a lot of the interest in seasonal predictability in the Arctic has grown in the last decade or so because of the long-term changes happening in the sea ice cover. So this shows the time series of September sea ice in the Arctic from 1979 here to 2020. And you can see over this time period, over the modern satellite era, we've had this dramatic loss of Arctic sea ice, you know, values around 7 million square kilometers or more in the 1980s. Last year, we were less than 4 million square kilometers for the month of September in the Arctic. So the change is rapid, it's dramatic, it's affecting the entire Arctic system. On top of this, of course, you can see that there's also this very large year-to-year -year variations in sea ice. And so I've just pulled out two years here, which are kind of the extreme year-to-year -year variations you might expect, but September 2012 here, which was our uh, the minimum in the record, and um, 2013, uh, so the next year. And you can see that, um, you know, the difference in sea ice here is dramatic. And if you're thinking about marine access in the Arctic, um, you know, this 2012 conditions had extensive open waters um, north of Alaska and Bering Strait, um, whereas in 2013, there was much more ice cover there. So this has real implications for people um, accessing the Arctic. And there has been a lot of changes um, in terms of things like shipping in the Arctic. So um, this uh, just shows some, some ships within the Arctic. This one's actually named Marika, which I thought was great. I could find a, a vessel um, that has my name. But um, these ships are actually going through the Arctic. They're going through the Arctic more frequently. And so there is a real need for these kinds of predictions on seasonal timescales um, for these marine access considerations. There's also a need from them um, in the context of indigenous hunters. Um, and so, for example, there's a sea ice for walrus outlook, which is basically to support indigenous hunters in the region who are hunting walrus that pull out onto the sea ice. So um, these changes are happening, they're happening rapidly, and it's brought this sort of new interest in being able to predict sea ice on these seasonal timescales um, to have safe marine access in the region. So in the context of that, there's been a great deal of research in the last decade or so on the topic of predictability of sea ice on seasonal timescales. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background on that um, and some of the major things that have been found. Uh, and I'm gonna put that in the context of this autocorrelation plot um, that was published by Ed Blanchard-Rigglesworth back in 2011, so about a decade ago. 
So this shows just the lagged autocorrelation of the northern hemisphere ice area. So here you can see you know, January at the top correlated with January. So the, the values on the diagonal here are going to be one. And then in following months, just to get a sense of how persistent sea ice anomalies might be, et cetera. And what you can see from this is that there is a persistence time scale in the sea ice area of several months. So no matter what month you look at here, you know, it's, it's highly correlated for the next two to three months. So that suggests some predictability in the sea ice on that kind of time scale. Additionally, there's an interesting structure here that there are anomalies that reemerge in the sea ice cover. And so in order to explain that, I'm gonna put it in the context of the ice area annual cycle, which you can see, this is just a climatological annual cycle that's shown for two years to illustrate um, why we get this reemergence of anomalies. So you can see that here, I'm highlighting it in the circle here where some of this reemergence occurs. So say May sea ice anomalies, um, you get very little correlations, uh, kind of, you know, October time period, but then those um, uh, correlations increase and become significant again. And so what's happening here is during this sort of ice retreat season that these months represent, you can see on the ice area annual cycle, the sea ice is undergoing a very dramatic reduction. So it's melting back into the Arctic basin. And as it does that, it can leave um, ocean heat content anomalies behind. So how rapidly the sea ice melts back can influence things like how much solar absorption there is in the ocean, which can lead to ocean heat content anomalies. But then the sea ice doesn't feel for several months because it's melting back into the Arctic basin. But when the ice regrows in the fall and winter, it can re-encounter those ocean heat content anomalies and give a predictable signal. So that leads to this reemergence of predictability at this time of year. We also see a reemergence of these anomalies um, from one summer to the next often. And the mechanism for that is actually quite different. So here again, it's being illustrated on the plot um, of the annual cycle. The predictability me mechanism that drives that kind of summer to summer predictability is um, associated with ice thickness anomalies. So ice thickness anomalies um, can uh, arise in the fall freeze up time period, depending on atmospheric conditions, et cetera. And those ice thickness anomalies are long lived. Ice thickness anomalies then can influence the melt out the next summer. And so you can get um, this reemergence of those anomalies from one summer to the next associated with those long lived ice thickness anomalies. So there's different aspects of um, predictability on these different timescales, depending on the seasonality. But these are some of the kind of major background of, of what we think is going on with sea ice predictability. I'm showing this from this one study, um, which was one of the first studies to sort of document this. But this has been found uh, in numerous other studies. So it's not just based on these autocorrelations. It's based on a lot of other evidence as well. OK. so. There's a lot of evidence that we do have predictability in sea ice on seasonal out to perhaps interannual timescales. Um, and that that is an initial value um, predictability aspect of the system. But of course, you know, those, uh, the system is chaotic and the degradation in that predictability is associated with the sensitive dependence on those initial conditions. Um, I think this, this uh, plot um, that's actually from a paper by Brandstetter and Tang um, nicely shows, though, that there might be uh, different uh, predictability characteristics depending on where you start, um, what your, your um, climate conditions are, say. So, for example, here on the left, you have you know, a cloud of initial conditions, say, and over time, those don't diverge a great deal. Um, suggesting that there's predictability out for quite a long period of time. Whereas the one on the right here, you can see that those initial conditions, the error in them um, grows dramatically, such that over the same period of time, you might have a much less predictable system. So 
these kinds of studies suggest that the predictability characteristics can be dependent on the initial conditions. And of course, that's been shown for a, a number of aspects of the system. And because the climate in the Arctic is changing so dramatically, it begs the question as to whether cold, thick, ice-covered Arctic uh, might have different predictability characteristics than a warm, thin, ice-covered Arctic. So I'm going to explore this question a little bit. And there's reason to believe for the sea ice that this could actually be important because sea ice processes are actually climate state dependent. And some of the sea ice processes that we know are important for um, this initial value predictability are climate state dependent. So one of these is ice growth. So um, thin ice uh, with less snow will grow more rapidly subject to the same portion. So if you look at the schematic on the left of the floating ice cover in the Arctic, you know, the ice is made up of um, regions of different thicknesses. There can be open water areas. There's snow on top of that sea ice, and all of that sea ice is in motion. Sea ice grows primarily at the base of the ice pack, and that growth is associated with the conduction of heat through the sea ice and snow, um, and that heat then being lost to the atmosphere. So basically, how much ice growth you have is associated with that conduction. And that is very strongly related to the thickness of the sea ice. So that's why um, if you look at just a you know, plot of ice growth versus ice thickness, you see that thinner ice will grow more rapidly. Um, this relationship is also nonlinear with ice thickness. It get, actually goes as one over the thickness because of that um, conduction relationship. So what this means is that this is actually a negative feedback on ice thickness. So if the ice thins, it'll grow a little more and counteract that thinning. And that is actually a feedback that is stronger in a thinner ice regime. So I'll um, come back to this when I'm talking about the predictability results. There are other aspects of sea ice processes that are climate state dependent, and in particular, the open water formation that happens during melting in the summer. So again, if you go back to this schematic on the left and you um, think about melting the sea ice vertically, um, which is how it primarily melts, areas of open water are going to preferentially occur in these thin ice regions because they can completely melt out. That then can have a big impact on the surface albedo feedback and how much shortwave you can have absorbed in the ocean. So um, we do see that the amount of open water formed per centimeter of ice melt is more effect effective in a thin ice regime. And again, that there's a nonlinear function of um, that open water formation efficiency with ice thickness. So we have these processes in the sea ice system that are climate state dependent. We have a rapidly um, thinning and uh, declining sea ice cover. So um, it begs the question of how um, Arctic sea ice predictability characteristics might change in a warming climate. Okay, so we set out to investigate this by using the community earth system model as a tool and performing sets of perfect model predictability experiments. So basically what we did is that for each decade from 1980 to 2030, we initialized ensemble predictions on January 1st in which we took um, restart conditions from the CESM1 large ensembles. We had a perfect knowledge of our initial state from the model. Um, we applied a very small perturbation to the um, round off level uh, perturbation in the air temperature. And then we ran one year predictions. For each climate state, each of those decades, we actually picked four initial states that sort of sampled across the range that we would get from the CESM1 large ensemble. And we performed 15 ensemble members for each prediction state. So I'm showing an example of that here for the Arctic Ocean ice volume predictions, just to illustrate the method. So the dashed lines are the CESM1 large ensemble range in this property. This is taken from 40 ensemble members of a free running climate model. So the spread across them is really a measure of internal variability in the CESM simulated climate. And then I've picked four different initial states from which to run my predictions. And I've run 15 ensemble members each. And you can see that 
after 20 or 30 days, those ensemble predictions start to diverge. And that divergence becomes actually considerably larger when they reach the melt season. OK, so this is shown for Arctic ice volume. Um, and we can quantify some metrics of predictability. And here I'm just using something very simple. I'm just looking at the spread across my prediction ensemble, which is shown, uh, the average of which is shown in blue, the individual uh, ensembles are shown in gray, and then the internal variability. And so if this prediction ensemble is much smaller than what we expect from internal variability, it suggests that there's a predictable signal, that the initial values are giving us some predictability of the sea ice volume. And again, I'm running these for a year, so you can see that um, how that uh, variance grows in our prediction ensemble throughout the year. And you can see it's always much less than internal variability, suggesting that for sea ice volume or sea ice thickness, there's a, a very um, highly predictable signal for an entire year. This is um, seen in many other studies as well. Um, and I'm just showing this for the 1980 ensemble set to illustrate the, um, the design of our study. Okay, so what about ice area? Because there's a lot more interest from stakeholders in ice area than in ice volume, because it's uh, much more uh, relevant to marine access considerations. So I'm showing basically the same plot of ice area variant or, or variance in the prediction ensemble in blue, the internal variability in red. And I'm just showing this for the summer. Um, all of these were initialized on January 1st. So we're looking out, you know, six to eight months here, six to nine months, and now to December actually. And you can see that this actually looks really different than the ice volume. The um, prediction ensemble variance um, across the ensemble members is indistinguishable from internal variability. So this really suggests that for 1980, at least, there's no predictability for summertime sea ice area based on initialized forecasts in January. But we see something quite different as we move into the future with a thinner and warmer sea ice cover. We actually see that um, we start to uh, have a predictable signal in the Arctic sea ice area. Um, and um, the initialization uh, prediction spread from our initial um, prediction ensemble is considerably less than what we get just from internal variability. Uh, and this is particularly true at 2010. So I'm showing this here just in these simple kind of um, variance uh, metrics, but we see this also if we look at something like the anomaly um, correlations as well. Um, so it looks like as we move into a warmer, uh, thinner um, Arctic system, we have enhanced predictability. And this is true when we look at these hemispheric metrics. It's also true if we look at maps of sea ice concentration in the Arctic. Um, this is just shown where uh, this, the prediction skill here would be higher in the darker blue colors. Um, and again, when you look uh, kind of across the Arctic, um, it looks like there's enhanced predictability and that predictability is particularly strong in this 2010 time period. Okay, so why? Is this the case? Um, so we know based on these previous studies that ice thickness is a very important predictor of summer ice area. So we can use that to think about what causes a loss of predictability in the sea ice system. Um, so we know uh, ice thickness is important because those thickness anomalies are long lived and thickness anomalies at the beginning of the summer can affect how much melt out we get over the summer. So that we can relate to that then to the loss of predictability by looking at these two different factors. What's the growth of our ice thickness anomalies from their initialized state? So this would be an ice thickness error growth metric. And basically, this is just shown here from one ensemble set. Um, I'm showing it in terms of ice volume, but that's just the integrated um, metric of ice thickness. And you can see that over time, those ice thickness um, the simulations start to diverge in their ice thickness such that by early summer, um, when they can affect melt out, you have a considerable spread across them. So we can just quantify this by looking at the spread across our ensemble members. 
The other aspect of this loss of predictability is how these ice thickness anomalies at the beginning of summer affect the meltout over the summer and ultimately affect the September sea ice area. And we can quantify that by just looking at the regression of September ice area on the July ice thickness. And that's what's shown here. And you can see it's quite linear. So we are just going to use a regression metric for that to look at the meltout sensitivity to these thickness errors. Okay, so what does this look like when we look across our simulations and the um, changes over time? So here we have our January initialized conditions where the error in ice thickness um, quantified as the spread across our prediction ensembles is very small. And then you can see it grows um, into the, the months into the future. You also see that that ice thickness error growth is smaller in the warmer climate. And that's because of this ice thickness, ice growth rate relationship, which is um, climate state dependent, which means that anomalies in thin ice are more strongly damped. So it's related to this ice growth, ice thickness relationship and the fact that that is nonlinear. In terms of this meltout sensitivity to ice thickness errors, um, we see something actually quite different. We see that that's actually larger in the warmer climate. So again, I'm just computing this based on a regression of September ice area on the um, previous July ice thickness anomalies. And you can see that um, from 1980 here, that value is quite low, but out in the warmer climate of the 2020s and 2030s, that um, value is quite large. So that meltout sensitivity to ice thickness grows in a warming climate. This is consistent with um, there being a lot of thin ice that can, um, depending on the weather conditions in the summer, can easily melt out, or if it's a little colder, can actually um, stick around uh, for the summer months. And that's related um, to this uh, influence of ice thickness on the open water formation efficiency uh, associated with summer ice melt. So we have these two competing aspects um, that affect the predictability in the system. We have this growth of the ice thickness and anomalies from their initialized state that's smaller in the warmer climate. And we have um, the fact that those ice thickness anomalies can affect summer meltout, which is larger in the warmer climate. So these two things compete. Um, and it actually means that there's this kind of sweet spot for predictability it's in these moderate conditions, which in our climate model simulations are um, for the, our 2010 ensemble state. And so in this case, the September sea ice area predictability is highest because they have those simulations have a modest ice thickener, thickness error growth. Um, and those ice thickness errors at the beginning of the melt season have a modest influence on the um, September sea ice area. Um, so uh, that's why we have the largest September sea ice um, predictability for that, uh, that state of the climate. OK, so just to conclude, um, Arctic sea ice area has predictability on seasonal and longer timescales. Um, and there are different mechanisms that drive that depending on whether you're looking at summer or winter sea ice conditions. In terms of the summer ice area predictability, um, it's related to long-lived ice thickness anomalies that can affect meltout. And both the longevity of those anomalies, those ice thickness anomalies, and how effectively they impact meltout um, does depend on the sea ice state. So because of that, we expect predictability characteristics of sea ice to change in a warming climate. And I haven't touched on this here, but I think it's been mentioned um, in other talks and is also a very active um, area of research. Um, but these predictable signals in the sea ice can also impart predictability to the atmosphere and to the ocean and to the marine biogeochemistry. And those are really interesting topics that um, you know, are worth looking into and hold some promise for increasing our ability to predict on these sort of seasonal timescales, not just for the sea ice, but for other aspects of the system as well. And so with that, I'm happy to take any questions if there are some, and I have to throw a polar bear in because I took this photo and uh, I'm an Arctic scientist, so yeah. Anyway, 
thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take questions if there are some. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Monica, for a great talk on the Arctic. Thank you. Um, I see Judith, you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I feel the ice component is something that came a little bit too short uh, in this workshop, but um, there will be future workshops to, to address that more. Um, my question um, is on the um, uh, uncertainty associated with unrepresented um, subgrid scale processes and subgrid scale heterogeneity. And I was wondering if you could comment on that and if you think plays a role for these initialized forecasts you have been doing? I think it does. So, so there is some evidence um, that our climate models, uh, these kind of perfect model experiments, might be too predictable. And I know this is quite different from other aspects of the climate system, like the NAO, where it looks like our models might not be predictable enough. But um, there's some evidence that sea ice is too predictable. Um, and I actually think that there may be some issues with how we represent subgrid scale processes in the model, things like wave sea ice actions, which can add noise and you know, ruin pr our predictable signals, things like subgrid scale heterogeneity of snow on sea ice, which we don't represent well at all, but which is really important for things like that ice growth, um, ice thickness relationship. So it's another source of noise in the system that I actually don't think we capture well. Um, and so I, and that's true for the albedo too. So all these things that can impact um, these predictable signals, I think are not terribly well represented in terms of the, their subgrid scale heterogeneity. And I think they could definitely impact um, a lot of these things that we see are important for the sea ice predictability like how rapidly ice grows, um, how rapidly ice growth might kind of uh, reduce anomalies in the system, those kinds of things. So yeah, I think it's really important to improve those aspects of our models. Great. Thanks, Judith, and thanks, Marika. Chidong, you have a question in the chat. Yes, I, I just one, uh, wonder what is the role of the MIZ in the predictability of the solid sea ice. So when you talk about the ice, the uh, ice thickness, I assume you are um, um, talking about the, the solid sea ice. But then between the solid sea ice and open ocean, we have the MIZ. MIZ means the marginal ice zone. There's a lot of uh, um, ice, uh, floating ice, and uh, open small open water. So it's the mixture of ice and water. I mean, for the sake of students. So I wonder. Uh, what's the role of MIZ in the prediction, predictability of the solid sea ice? Yeah, so I, I think the, the size of the MIZ, um, especially when you're moving into the summer months, uh, is going to be associated in part with how thick that the sea ice is from the previous winter. So how rapidly you can melt that out, how rapidly you can break it up with winds and, and other things that actually affect uh, the MIZ. So I think there is some relationship between like the, the size of the MIZ and the winter time sea ice thickness, say if you're looking from winter to summer months. Um, the MIZ itself, um, being able to predict, say the, the size of that, um, the location of it is of course a really important topic. And again, there are things that we don't represent well in the MIZ, um, wave sea ice actions is, is a um, particular, particularly important thing that we don't include in our climate models yet, um, but it's coming. So I think that'll help improve things like the prediction of the MIZ and um, how rapidly the MIZ um, you know, grows and how large it is and, and those kinds of aspects of, of um, the sea ice system. Great. <laughs> thanks, Chirami. Thanks, Monica. I... I had a question, like on uh, in terms of the future projection. You showed that as we get into warmer climates, the seasonal time scale predictability increases, or the internal variability across the ensembles reduces. Right? If we look at subseasonal time scale or shorter time scales, 
would you have a comment on how that would change, especially with, for instance, if the jet stream shifts north and we have more variable um, weather, uh, like extratropical cyclones or like Arctic cyclones impacting sea ice melt, those are probably less predictable on, um, uh, on short time scales, right? How would, yeah. Yeah, so I think, and I think the sea ice is also more responsive to those right. in, in a warmer climate. And so I would expect, on, I mean, and I haven't looked at this, but my yeah. expectation would be on sub-seasonal timescales, we would see a loss of predictability in a warming climate, yeah. um, both because there's a potential for increased storms, say, yeah. and also because any individual storm has more potential to break up the sea ice. Right. Thinner sea ice is more... Um, able to move and be impacted um, dynamically by the winds. Um, and so those kind of aspects uh, are likely to lead to less predictability on sub-seasonal timescales in a warming Arctic. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and I guess like sub-seasonal timescale information would be useful for like navigation in the future Arctic or operations there, right? If yeah, and there's a lot of work going on in that area as well. I'm just yeah. less involved in it, um, you know, in terms of sea ice motion. Um, and there is a lot of predictability actually on subseasonal time scales for the sea ice. Um, so there is a lot of persistence. Um, so, so that's good news um, <laughs> in terms of the subseasonal time scales. Although, again, I think it's likely to be impacted by the long term climate change that we're um, undergoing. So, yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks again for a yeah, really uh, great talk on the Arctic and polar climate. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks.